Cracking the Code viewers, did you know that the awesome magnet, Cracking the Code's custom smartphone guitar camera mount, is now on Kickstarter? I think you did, or I hope you did, because it's there now. And as of this writing, I am happy to report that we are about two-thirds of the way toward our goal. Two-thirds of the way there to making the magnet be a consumer product reality for all of us, including ourselves, so that we no longer have to laboriously make these things by hand. Um, how do we get all the way there? Well, we get there with your help. And I've seen a few comments to the effect of, hey, this looks really cool, and I would be happy to get one when it becomes available. And see, there's the trick. <laughs> because if we, don't meet, if we don't meet the goal, then we don't get any of the cash, and we can't afford to make the magnet, and then it will never become available. So if the magnet looks cool to you, and you, might, you think you might want one, and you can spare the cash, and I know that's kind of a big ask because these are tough times, but if you can spare the cash now, the best thing to do is to back the project because that, as soon as we get to our goal, then the magnet becomes a reality. You can always get more later. We can make them in different colors, maybe make other design tweaks over time. But to get this guy out the door at all, we need to hit that goal, and we've got about 23 more days to do it. How do you do it? Well, it's pretty easy. You just head on over to Kickstarter. Actually, scratch that. We'll make it even easier. Just head over to TroyGrady.com forward slash magnet, and we'll redirect you to the magnet page on Kickstarter. Or you can click the link in the description uh, below. That'll take you right there as well. While you're contemplating doing that, we filmed a cool walkthrough of some of the prototypes that we built in the process of designing the magnet as it currently is. And that's pretty cool because it's a little window into sort of the thought process that we went through to, uh, to build this crazy thing. And I'm going to play that, uh, that little walkthrough for you right now. I thought I would show you while we're at this um, how we kind of came up with this um, with the device. I have some the equivalent of kind of magnet baby pictures here, which are some of our prototype attempts at, at um, building the device. And I'll show you, this is one of the very first ones that we came up with. It's kind of like a cuff in a way. This might have been like the core of the, or the original insight was that there might be something that's sort of clamp-like that goes around the neck. And, um, but from an industrial design perspective, this is almost like the ID equivalent of a stick figure. It's just a line. So it's elegant, right? And it's cool. And, it's, and the material's a little bit stretchy. So I think we were thinking that there might be some kind of almost like a tension-y way that would hold on the neck. But the, everything else was not really here yet. There was a, we put a quarter 20 kind of hole in there. We imagined that you'd put a quarter 20 screw and then what? Screw a camera onto the top of it or something. I, we didn't even really kind of think this through. Needless to say, the tension aspect didn't really work, right? And even if you could get a screw in there and screw on a camera, that would be what? The camera would be like up here and your picking hand is down here. So you'd kind of be looking down from like a lifeguard stand onto your, onto your picking motion. And that's tricky because again, to get that magnet, that sort of classic magnet shot, you want to be low down to the string so that you can see the pick hitting the string and or missing or not missing the surrounding strings as a way of knowing what kind of motion you're making. Is it the double escape, the single escape? and so on. So this positioned the camera way too high, and, and I think we were also probably thinking GoPro or something at that point, which is why we had a screw here. And a GoPro would be like way up here, right? So we said, okay, what about phone? Let's, let's rethink this. And um, we took what is a very literal <laughs> stab at a phone mounting device. Like, again, very literal stick figure-like interpretation. A phone, it is square. <laughs> and there is a hole for a camera for a phone. And there is a arm which comes down. This really didn't work at all, uh, barely. Um, but we were on this, this, onto this idea that, okay, the camera kind of needs to be down here. It can't be all the way up in the sky pointing down at the hand. It's got to be down and, and looking down the strings, the same way our original um, magnet rig did, did back in the day. And I don't remember what phone we designed this for, but obviously this kind of opening in here, I don't know if you can see that, where the phone would, would go, it, there's no variability in that. Like this fits one and only one phone, whatever our test mule was at the time. And the camera placement also very rigid. Um, and uh, well, there you go. <laughs> um, so then in thinking about this, we kind of came back to the cuff idea again. And then we came up with this. And we're like, oh, look at that. Well, it's a cuff, but look what we got now. The slot concept. 
we realized that if we kind of cut a hole in it, like a slice of bread or a hot dog roll, you could kind of slide the phone in and then maybe move it around. You'd have some ability to adapt to different kinds of phones. Um, the width, however, of the device, not adaptable. This is designed to fit whatever six string width neck or something. And then whatever width phone, also not adjustable. So more of a concept, but the slot concept proved, um, proved useful as, a, as a, a springboard. And now, so here was our next attempt. And this one here, I will tell you, this is the first functional magnet prototype. And we actually used this in an, uh, an interview with Rusty Cooley, incredible Rusty Cooley. This was, I think, I forget if it was this one or a slightly wider one. That we, we specifically printed this, 3D printed this to fit a seven string width neck. And we specifically designed the width of the gap here to fit, I think it was an iPhone 4, 4, 4S maybe, I forget what it was. But it, it specifically only worked with that phone and on a seven string neck. But now we had the slot concept and it works. You could kind of stick the phone in upside down and the camera would be down here. And you could get that, that angle uh, down the strings. We had this platform here though, which prevented the phone from going below a certain point because we figured you, know, you need the platform in order to uh, stop this, the phone from hitting the strings. But we still don't have any width of variability for different necks. We still don't have any slot size variability for um, different width phones. So very limited kind of thing that maybe would work in a one-off sense, but certainly couldn't be generally useful. So then we started thinking about like the slot idea and how you would get, like, could you make it expandable? And we had all gone through all these kind of like mental gymnastics to try and figure out how you would do that. And then one day I was walking out of the office and I was going down the stairs and it's just like light bulb moment. It hit me and I was like, oh my God, if you want to expand the device in two dimensions, you have to put the expansion rods or the springs, whatever they are, they have to be in two non-intersecting planes. So you could have one expansion kind of track up here and then two more expansion tracks down here, two separate ones in the legs. So you could actually pull the thing apart in two dimensions and they wouldn't interfere with one another. And I was like, that, that can't be right. And I ran home and I did a little animation of this and I sent it to the guys and I was like, is this it? And they were like, yeah, I think that's it. And so uh, we came up with this. This was another kind of prototypey 3D printed thing, but this was the beginnings of the modern magnet. So what do you got here? You have two halves. They stick together like this, but they also stick together like this. How cool is that? It's almost like a puzzle that you would, like a wooden piece puzzle, right? We're trying to figure out how the parts go together. And we had kind of the staggered way, I don't know if you can see that, where the two pieces kind of fit like this. And there's compression springs in the top here through these little holes. And so you can kind of pull it apart this way to fit variable length, variable width necks. But you can also pull it apart this way to fit um, variable width or thickness phones. And we didn't know how to, to give it stability when you pulled it wider like this. So we just kind of tacked on these plastic skis right here. I don't know if you can see that. So, but this was basically, this was the, the first iteration of what is the modern magnet. And then we designed the skis, we took the, the little plastic sleds there and actually built them into the swoop of the 3D model. And lo and behold, the first functional modern magnet. How cool is that? So basically, this one, we just, this doesn't have the, the, the springs in it. This is just so we can take it apart and show you how it all works. But this was 3D printed, I think, at Shapeways, which is a great um, 3D printing by mail kind of uh, provider. And we had to scrounge for all the parts to make it work, but this actually worked. And this magnet is the one that we've used on all of our interviews up until very recently. Going out on the highway, gonna listen to them big trucks wide. And uh, it has proven incredibly resilient. And, and I think one of the things about good design is you know a design is good when you can start using it for purposes you didn't even intend and it still works. Like we discovered that if you just put a little spacer pad here, you can use it on mandolin and it works perfectly. Even with a phone, you would think it'd be too heavy or something. But because this mounts where the neck meets the body, you don't really notice the extra weight because it's close or you will notice it, but it's, you're not swinging around all that mass at the end of a at the end of the headstock where you would really notice it. It's right here at the, at the center of, of mass. And so there's not a lot of polar. It's a low moment, polar moment of inertia. Am I getting that right for you uh, automotive fans? I believe it's a low 
polar moment of inertia. There's not a lot of, you know, it's like a, we, in a, like a high-end sports car where they, they do the mid-mounted engine. The car doesn't want to swivel a lot. It's very stable. So this d- design, even though we kind of expected, oh, we'll make tweaks to it over the years, has turned out to be incredibly adaptable. And it's worked for all sorts of things that we didn't even initially imagine it would. And so in the run-up to the most the Kickstarter video that you just watched, we actually did make two tweaks that are the result of years of, of, of having used this in real-world scenarios. One of them is um, we reversed the operation of the sliding. So in the older device, the sleds open toward the headstock. And if you were to use a very large phone, like with a battery case or something, that would theoretically eat up more available fretboard for where you would want to play. Oh, you know, I had a really cool trill lick that I would have liked to have shown you. Um, but it usually, it takes up the whole fretboard. So we realized that if you just turn this around like this and had it open toward the pickups instead or toward the bridge, then wherever you position this edge of the magnet, that's it, right? That's, you're never going to lose more fretboard than that because there is some impingement in the playing area. Then that's just a natural consequence of attaching to the neck. So now the magnet opens this way, amazingly enough. And finally, we added this other tweak, which is we tried to figure out how can we strap this on so it won't come off. And um, you will notice over the years, and we've posted clips of this, like every great player has knocked this thing off, like Martin Miller. (laughs) His blazing, shredding away, and of course knocks it off. So we had a safety strap idea. And it turns out we did a couple of iterations on this, and this is the absolute most elegant way we could think of to do it. It's just a loop with a, um, a lock at one end. And you just go like this, put it right through the neck, and then pull it tight, and you're good to go. And it will not come off. Like, it'll hang, but this, unless the strap breaks, which it pretty much never will, it's not coming off. Your, the magnet is not coming off the neck. It might dangle a little bit if you really knock it, but your phone's not going to hit the floor, and the magnet won't hit the floor. The side uh, benefit that we noticed with this, and the reason why we have the cord coming out this side, which is the side that expands as opposed to the other side, is that when it wraps around the neck, it actually cinches this closed even more tightly. So the advantage of the safety strap design that we did is it's not just a safety strap, it also is a tightening strap. It holds the whole thing together more tightly. And the reason this matters is because in the way that we mount um, the phone, very often players will knock the edge of the phone with their knee and then knock the shot crooked. So halfway through an interview, you have to go in and recorrect it because you realize that somebody was furiously shredding and he kind of knocked the camera crooked or something like that. So now this is much like, less likely to happen. Once this thing is, is locked in and tightened up, not only will the magnet not come off the guitar, but it is much less likely to get knocked loose as well. So, incredible. Uh, it's been a, a bit of a long road, but this is the device we've ended up with. I use this thing almost every day. It is absolutely invaluable, not just for the work that we do, but also it just makes reviewing your own playing so much easier. Again, yes, you could get a tripod. You could put it over there and try to get the right angle, but it's always a game of trial and error. This thing is dead simple. You just snap it on like this, slide in the phone. And because the phone is so self-contained, most phones have uh, an incredible array of camera technology now. You can turn on the light on that thing and be sitting in your living room at midnight with no amp on and you're electric and turn on the light and you can get a perfectly clear 120 frames per second slow motion view of your own playing without disturbing anybody. And I've I've used this all the time. So the magnet is probably just the easiest way to film your own playing for whatever reason, even if it's not specifically to nerd out on picking motions. But um, it just makes that whole process about as error proof um, as, as it can be. What hasn't been error-proof is making these things. The process of making these is super laborious. We 3D print these parts, but they never fit right. And when we get them back, we have to file them down. And every time we do it, they come out a little bit different. Sometimes you file too much and they're loose and they don't kind of work right. Other times, um, they're, you can get the tolerances good, but they're so tight that it's kind of sticky. As it happens, this version with the new reversed sleds, or skid, the skis, and um, the safety strap, this particular one is the best functioning 3D printed magnet we have ever made. It works better than all the other hand done ones for just completely arbitrary reasons. We have not changed the model at all. The design of it is exactly the same as far as the internal workings, but just the randomness of the 3D printing process. So 
where am I going with this? Mass production doesn't use 3D printing. It uses injection molding, where when you get the tolerances exactly the way you want them, they are perfect every time. And that is why we want to mass produce these things. I have precisely one of these right now. This is the only one we've made with the new features. If we want another one, we're going to have to order more parts and file them down and hope for the best. <laughs> but if I could just reach into a box and grab one, it would be incredible. And that's what we want your help to do. We want to make these things better than the best one we've ever made um, at the press of a button. You just pop on our website or wherever we have these things and you just order it. That's what we want to do. And not only that, but the, the, the material itself, like this Shapeways material is great, but it's got kind of a little bit of a sandy texture to it. And so, if you can hear that, there's a little bit of friction there. This one, another reason why this is one of the best ones we've ever made is that I can do this one-handed. You put this on the neck, and I can actually just pull this side of it, if I do it right, with one hand without using this hand, and it'll open up and I can put in the phone with the other hand. If this material were smoother, like a truly frictionless injection molded plastic, we would be able, or you'd be able to, to pop that on and to easily, with one hand, I, I think it will be easily one hand operation when we pull that apart, slide, drop in the phone, faster and more reliable and like butter smooth, more so th even than this one is. So that's our goal really. We wanna make this thing uh, so that we can use it. We need your help to make it so that we can use it. But we think it's an incredible learning tool and it will be a better learning tool even than the best one that we've ever made. So, you want to help us out? We would be thrilled. Head on over to Kickstarter. I'll put the URL here. I don't remember what it is. <laughs> but head on over to Kickstarter and check out the project and uh, help us make the magnet, man. And thanks so much for watching Cracking the Code.